Elmira is also going to record. Any last questions? Nope. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Just got the final countdown here. <laughs> I feel like we should break out in karaoke now. Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to open Someone up else, the waiting room. Bonnie, um, <laughs> you and I are the only ones. Welcome, everyone. Hi there. Welcome to the Animal Liberation Online Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just while we wait for everyone to get in from the waiting room, we're going to hear some music. So uh, thank you so much to Sally Zito for being our uh, performer today. And this is Sally singing Lives Are Beautiful. Thanks very much, Johanna. Hi everyone, uh, I just wanna share a song that I wrote with an animal rights activist from Malaysia who contacted me, a beautiful poet who wrote this poem that I set music to. And um, it's basically um, written from the point of view of an animal looking at his captor, trying to inform him that all lives are valuable and that even though his soul will go on beyond his own death, that he's afraid of what is about to happen. So it's sort of a conversation between an animal and, and his captor. And the poet's name is Telling You Dear, in case you want to look her up. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, that was Sally Zito singing Lives Are Beautiful. And yeah, just another thank you so much uh, to Sally. She's often our musician on these calls and we just love having you here, Sally. Um, so welcome, if you joined us uh, during the song, this is the Animal Liberation Online Assembly. And I'm so excited to have you all here today. Um, yeah, welcome. So we are a global community united for animal liberation. And my name is Joanna, I'll be your host for today. And before we get started, um, just an invitation to rename yourself on Zoom uh, if you haven't already done so. So we, we really appreciate when people have their name um, and their pronouns as well in their name. And if you wanna put your city in there, it's kind of cool we can see you know where everybody is and maybe you'll meet somebody who lives close to you. Um, we also have ASL interpretation on the call, um, but we are asking for people to watch our Facebook live stream if you need that. So um, if you do want to see the ASL interpretation, you can just watch the Facebook live stream by going to this link right here. 
Um, this is also an invitation for you to find the chat and just use it throughout the call to engage with each other. Um, you can also ask questions to our speakers and we'll try to make sure that they um, get to some of those throughout the call. And, you know, just because we're not sharing walls today, um, we are in a room together. So let's just take a moment to kind of arrive here, um, look around and just remember uh, that we are part of a community. And of course, we do want to uphold the same standards of conduct online that we do when we gather in physical space. So anybody violating our code of conduct is going to be removed from the call. So today we're talking about direct action. And over the past several months, we've seen not just the animal rights movement, but so many movements around the world rising up and using nonviolent direct action to affect change. Like this fall, when uh, animal rights activists around the world participated in a global campaign for an animal bill of rights, a lot of them locking down facilities where animals are being used. Um, but what comes next? So a lot of us understand that disruptive tactics are really able to start conversations and bring attention to an issue. But today we're also going to be talking about what else needs to be present in order for lasting change to occur. So we should remember that we're in a movement and this is a dynamic, diverse thing. It's not just one group. And so the changes that we're fighting for won't be one as a product of just one group. It's really the collective movement that creates the conditions together for change to happen. So with that being said, before we jump into today's conversation, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about some of the things that are happening um, in our movement, some cool stories that have happened in the last month, or some of them aren't so cool, I guess. Um, so first up, we have this story that uh, came out of Denmark, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, obviously, you know, I think most of us know that animal farming and pandemics are inextricably inextricably linked and it was discovered in Denmark recently that I believe the coronavirus had jumped from humans to mink and mutated and was able to jump back to humans. Um, and so Denmark decided to kill all the mink in the country. Now, obviously this is a sad story because all of these mink were killed. Um, you know, they were being raised on a fur farm so they, they were going to be killed anyways, but there's something that we can kind of take away from this and you know, this is another dilemma with regards to this same pandemic that's forcing people to look at our relationship to animals and the way that we use animals. And it shows why this is really an important moment for us to be talking about animal liberation and thinking about how we can get this narrative um, into the mainstream. Because as we move through and on from this pandemic, we have an opportunity to really be part of this conversation that society is having right now and to make animals a part of that conversation as well. And something else, um, you know, that is kind of interesting about this story is just the fact that something, uh, an article like this was able to be um, posted on something as reputable as The Guardian, um, you know, someone here is talking about that link between animal exploitation and pandemics and kind of saying, you know, we're not listening to, um, to what's happening right now. So the next story is about this documentary that came out, um, I believe last weekend, uh, that there was a killing. And this is a really important documentary for our movement. And if you aren't familiar, um, this is the story of Regan Russell. And she was an activist in Toronto, Canada, who was killed by a slaughter truck um, at a save movement vigil. And the when she was killed, it was one day after some new legislation had been enacted where um, basically truck drivers were not going to be held responsible if activists were killed at these kinds of events, um, among other like repressions that the government was enacting because of the pressure that animal activists are putting onto these um, industries and onto this system. And bills like that, um, things that are kind of fighting back against activists, against these, you know, nonviolent things that we're doing, just giving water to pigs, for example, it really shows that what we're doing is a threat to the industry. And so, um, you know, that is one of the reasons why this uh, kind of bill was enacted. But this documentary shares Regan's story and they interview eyewitnesses and former truck drivers and lawyers. And it's just really, um, it's really a horrific story, but an incredible documentary. So if you haven't checked it out yet, um, you can just go to therewasakilling.com and uh, it's available for free online to watch there. Finally, um, you know, I know we're all sick of, of politics, but this one is, is worth mentioning, um, this story about the rescue dog in the White House. And obviously this is, you know, a great story because it's a win for animals. Um, 
not just because it's normalizing the idea of animal rescue, but you know, it's kind of this milestone for rescue animals where it's like they have one of their own in the White House now. Um, but the fact that this story went so big, I think shows us something that we can actually learn from. Um, one thing is what we already know, which is that people really do love animals. And we've seen so many, you know, huge publications like cheering on this dog because um, they're a rescue animal and they're gonna be in the White House now. But we can also learn a lot about a really successful animal rights campaign. Um, the Adopt Don't Shop campaign has been around for you know probably decades at this point. And um, this story just kind of shows how successful that campaign has been because there was a time when rescue animals were very stigmatized and people didn't want to take you know animals from shelters. And there are still people who feel that way. But the fact that huge publications like the New York Times and National Geographic are talking about this and rooting for these animals, um, you know, shows us that we can learn something from that campaign, you know, adopt animal adoption is so normalized now that people here are cheering for these adopted animals. So finally, um, next month is our uh, last online assembly from of 2020. Now I'm going to try to launch a poll here. Um, Oh no, where's my other poll? <laughs> Maybe I'm not gonna launch a poll. Oh, here we go. No, okay, I don't know. Oh wait, okay, I got it. This is my first time using polls on Zoom. So <laughs> here we go. Um, so we want your input in what we should do for next month. Um, you know, we're, should we do some kind of year in review where we're talking about everything that happened, uh, you know, for animals in 2020? Um, do you want us to feature more speakers? Uh, do you want us to talk to like a politician or something? So let us know, hopefully uh, you can vote in this poll. And um, while we're waiting for everybody to vote as well, um, just let us know in the chat, like what you like about these calls. It's really helpful for us to just know what you want more of. So, um, you know, is it, do you like the speakers? Do you like just kind of coming together on Zoom with a bunch of people every month? Um, Tanya says she likes seeing everyone together. Um, like seeing people from around the world coming together on Zoom. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really cool to just have this kind of community that we're still able to, to meet even though we can't get together in person. Um, people saying it feels, uh, reminds us that we're a movement still because some of us are feeling a little bit isolated, the community. Um, awesome. Well, I'm going to end this poll now uh, so that we can move on. And thank you all so much. Oh, I don't know if this actually worked, but um, yeah, thank you all for weighing in and for letting me know in the chat what you appreciate and uh, we'll let you know soon what next month's assembly is going to be. So without further ado, I will get into today's topic of conversation now, which is the strategy of direct action. And like I said, you know, as a movement, we're pretty good at locking things down, but what else needs to happen for us to create change? So we have three really incredible guests here for this conversation, and they're all pioneers in our movement and represent different tactics and different periods for animal rights. Ronnie Lee has been a vegan and campaigner for animal liberation for almost 50 years. In the early 1970s, he was one of the founders of the Animal Liberation Front and spent a total of about nine years in prison for animal liberation activism. Since his last release from prison in 1992, he has been involved in various animal protection campaigns and political activities. And his main focus now is on vegan outreach and on the creation of a local network of vegan activist groups. Wayne Shung is the co-founder of the Global Animal Rights Network Direct Action Everywhere, or DXE. His work as an open rescue activist has been reported on in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and ABC's Nightline. And prior to co-founding DXE, Wayne studied behavioral economics as an NSF graduate fellow at MIT, served on the faculty at Northwestern School of Law, and practiced securities law while maintaining a pro bono practice representing victims of domestic violence. And Zoe Rosenberg is an 18 year old animal rights activist and student at the University of California, Berkeley. She founded Happy Hen Animal Sanctuary at age 11, a nonprofit which has now rescued over a thousand animals from factory farms, slaughterhouses and other abusive situations. She's also a TEDx speaker and the leader of Dir Direct Action Everywhere's social media team. So I'll pass it over to Zoe now. And yeah, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited to be in the presence of two uh, people who 
inspire me so much, Wayne and Ronnie. Um, and I know everyone's super excited to hear from both of them, especially Ronnie, who's, you know, obviously served prison time and done so many amazing things for our movement. Um, and, you know, all three of us have founded organizations for animal rights. And I think like to found an organization and dedicate, you know, so much of your time to something, obviously something has to like really push you to do that. Something has to really inspire you and move you in that direction um, in a big way. Um, and transformed your lives in such a big way that you literally decided to drop everything and start these organizations and dedicate your lives to animal rights. I don't know, Ronnie, maybe if, if you want to start and just kind of tell us your story. Well, it, well it, I mean, my story kind of starts when I became vegan. I'd, I'd, um, that was at the age of, um, uh, of 21. And two years before that, I'd become vegetarian. And my life, when I became vegetarian, my life didn't really change at all. I carried on exactly the same way except that I didn't eat meat and I had my legs pulled by my, my friends for not wanting a burger and um, not wanting to eat meat, but nothing else changed for me. Um, and then I um, discovered uh, what happened to, um, to cows and calves and um, hens and chickens. I found out through, um, it was actually um, through a copy of the Vegetarian Society's magazine that I picked up. And I, I read this article about veganism. I was horrified. I thought, right, I've, I've, I've got to go vegan now. In the same magazine, there were articles about other forms of um, the animal oppression, about animal experiments and hunting, etc. And I found I, I didn't know anything about these things. I, I was horrified. I thought, well, I've got to do something to, to stop all this. And um, I became a vegan very soon after that. Um, I, I saw a news item on the television about the Hunt Saboteurs, so I immediately joined the Hunt Saboteurs, became active with them, and then I, I kind of um, realised that um, uh, they needed to, that uh, the type of direct action being taken kind of needed to be extended, and myself and uh, a few other people that felt the same. Uh, uh, we we got together and, and we formed a we formed a group um, that we called the Band of Mercy. And it was called the Band of Mercy because in the uh, the nineteenth century there was a, a an RSPCA youth group that actually took direct action in, in in a small way, and so we wanted to revive that and we called our group the Band of Mercy. I mean later that was um, changed to the Animal Liberation Front to you know in order for people to understand what it was really about. And we embarked on a course of direct action. We started targeting um, uh, the, the, hunt, the hunts, um, damaging their vehicles. So they, they tried to stop them going out hunting. And then we, uh, we turned our attention to, um, to animal experiments. We carried out a lot of attacks. We tried to destroy a laboratory that was being built, caused a lot of damage to uh, vehicles and other property. Uh, belonging to people who bred and supplied animals to laboratories. Um, eventually, I, eventually, two of us were arrested. I ended up being sentenced to three years imprisonment. Uh, I was in prison for a year. I thought that that would uh, put people off from doing the same sort of thing, but it had actually seemed to have the opposite effect. Lots more people wanted to get involved, and and that's when it, that, that's when the animal liberation front really took off in the probably some mid to late. 1970s and uh, um, I became the because I was the probably the most well known of the ALF activists um, I became press officer for the, for the ALF but I, I still carried on um, doing actions myself as well and I, I actually served uh, two more prison sentences after that including uh, I got a 10-year sentence in the mid 1980s for conspiracy. And I was in prison for six years and eight months of that. So my total time in prison added up to about nine years. So that's that's the kind of story of <laughs> of, of my involvement with, with the Animal Liberation Front. And the Animal Liberation Front in the, I mean, it, it spread all over the world. Um, in the UK, the, the main successes of the ALF were really 
against the fur trade and against animal experimentation. Uh, the, um, the, the ALF absolutely decimated the fur trade. It was um, I mean, it wasn't just the ALF. There are other campaigns, but I think the ALF was the main reason why the fur trade was 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 virtually destroyed uh, in the UK. And uh, also, I think because of ALF actions, the number of animal experiments in the UK was 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 greatly reduced, and would have been a lot more had it not for, been for the ALF. So uh, it was, you know, it, it, the ALF is still going um, throughout the world, still going in the UK, um, very much less now for, for various reasons. Um, but certainly it's something that I'm very happy to have been involved in, certainly because of the, the number of animals' lives that have been spared. Yeah, that's so inspiring. I, I know like, you know, I've been an activist for about seven years now. And I always think about, you know, how far things had already come when I already started, because sometimes, you know, I kind of think of like, you know, protesting fur and animal testing is kind of being like the easy stuff. And, you know, I know that, you know, not that long ago, that was kind of where you know protesting that was as controversial as protesting me is now so i'm just so grateful to like you know people like you who were really trailblazers and you know made um our work today so much you know more powerful and effective now um and allowed us to to fight you know even bigger forms of animal cruelty because you know we couldn't have done that with without the work that you guys did um i don't know can Wayne, i jump in here to... yeah I yeah so I, I want everyone to understand just how legendary Ronnie Lee is and how legendary the ALF is, because if you don't understand the historical context, the animal protection movement is actually an old movement with a storied tradition in the United States and the United Kingdom. You can go back to William Wilberforce, an anti-slavery activist in the 19th century. He was very much an animal welfare advocate. Are you still hearing me? Everyone's, oh, just Zoe still. Yes. Um, okay, great. <laughs> And the United States, the animal cruelty laws in the United States actually predate laws against domestic violence and child abuse. So, you know, there are people concerned about citizens beating their horses in the mid 19th century. And so, but the problem was it was, it was always just about animal welfare and it was always just very rinky dick and no one thought that we could be bolder and, and move to bigger dreams and visions of a world where every animal is treated with decency and respect and with equality. And the 1970s were a crucial time period in the animal rights movement's history. You have Peter Singer's book 19, in 1975 being published, Animal Liberation, the first chapter of which was All Animals Are Equal, right? Which is a resounding clarion call for animal rights and animal welfare, not just to be this hobby for people who are kind on the weekends to engage in, but a true liberation movement, a social justice movement. But the folks who really brought this to life were the ALF. And you know, for over a century, we had been doing this rinky-dink act as begging and pleading, hey, can you hit your horse a little bit less frequently? And actually, the early laws in the United States that banned beating horses were not even laws against beating horses. You just couldn't beat them in public. It was considered a nuisance because if people had to see that shit in public, they got upset. And they said, okay, if you're going to beat your horses, just do it in a stall. Like, don't do it in a public street where children and, and women will get all upset. But if you beat your horses in your own stall, that's fine. And after 100 years of that, of people being so apologetic and terrified about being bolder to fight for animals, you have a group in the 1970s that said, you know, after 100 years of nonsense, enough is enough. We're just getting in there and we're liberating them all. We're going to break into these places and just let these animals go because time, you know, enough is enough. We have to stop holding captive, decimating, killing, enslaving, torturing these animals. We just have to let them go. And and that set the foundations for everything the movement's been since the 1970s, which it's still a very young movement. Uh, and, and for me, you know, I, 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 a lot of folks haven't heard this story about me, but if you know, my arc as an animal rights activist is almost the opposite of Ronnie's. Like Ronnie went from doing direct action and now doing educational work. And my first five, 10 years as an activist, you know, I was terrified about the words direct action. <laughs> like, I, the first time I met an activist who had engaged in direct action, a guy named Josh Schwartz, who went to prison on the Shack campaign, I was scared to be in his presence. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in the same room as this guy who went to prison for a year. Am I going to be tainted by association? Now here I am sitting before you with 16 felonies and 
you know, Ronnie's past may very well be my future, unfortunately, because I'm facing <laughs> potentially, I think, 80 plus years in prison or something like that. But, but I think the thing is, the shock to the system, both this, the animal rights movement and the broader political system that was achieved by the ALF in the 1970s has now resounded over the last four decades and created a movement that is a real social justice movement. So thank you, Ronnie. And we're all, I think, honored for, for you to be here today. Well, well thank you, Wayne. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's a, it's a great privilege to be talking to you and, uh, and, and the others. Um, I think, I think what, what's kind of happened over, over here, and I don't know if the situation in the USA, it's become much more difficult for, for the ALF to operate in the UK for, for various reasons. New laws that were brought in, um, additional police surveillance. I mean, the, the, the police, well, the government really set up special units to um, track down and arrest ALF activists. In fact, not just ALF activists, but really kind of, um, uh, to a large extent, any kind of anti anti vivisection activists, that tends to be their kind of main focus. And of course, anti vivisection was a was a main focus of, of the ILF. And so it's kind of a, a, a question now over here. And one of the reasons why I've gone more down the, the route of education is to, to say, OK, well, if, if one one route is blocked up, off to us, then we have to to see what other routes we can we can go down. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've taken the path I have. And, and I think there's a, there's a kind of difference between uh, with, with ALF action. ALF action was, was mainly um, aimed towards um, aimed towards causing damage to property to actually stop um, to stop that animal oppression. You know, to, you know, damage equipment that was used to um, to torture animals to uh, damage or destroy vehicles that were used for hunting and that kind of thing. Uh, and there was also economic sabotage, the idea of causing uh, huge amounts of damage to these companies. So they 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 no longer um, would be involved in animal oppression. And, that, and that's really where the, the success came against the fur industry, because the, the big stores that sold um, fur coats just as one of their many items that they sold decided it just wasn't worth it economically to to sell fur coats because the amount of damage they would sustain if they did and that's probably the main reason why the the, the fur industry went into decline um and then of course there was the animal rescue as well which uh, you know thousands tens of thousands of animals rescued from places as well that was the other so there were kind of three strings to the ALF bow. Um, but another thing that's happened now in, in, in the UK, I think the UK is, is the country in the world where it, there is the most surveillance. So many cameras everywhere. Uh, and with the digital age, security is so much cheaper. I mean, a lot of the targets we used to, we used to go for had little or no security. Um, the, the people who bred and supplied animals for laboratories very often they the, their only security was a lock on the door mm -hmm. so but, but now they'd have cameras and it, that it would all be connected to a control center and the police would be there in you know a matter of minutes so it's a completely different climate now so i think we kind of one thing that i, I think it's very important that our, 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 our movement is flexible and we kind of um we see what's against us and, and we adapt to campaigning in a way where we can still be effective. But I think what's, what, what still can be effective and, and what is effective it, um, is, is the tactic of, of, of open rescue. And that happens over here uh, as well. Uh, we have a, uh, an organisation over here called, called Meet the Victims, where meat is M-E-A-T. And they go into the, you know, the, these the in, intensive farms and, um, they'll do the same thing and, and, and rescue, you know, seek out the animals that are probably uh, more poorly and, and rescue those. And that generates a, a lot of publicity and often it's very positive publicity, you know, to make people aware, put pressure on the industry and, and hopefully, you know, cause a lot of people to go vegan because of the publicity. And, and so that's the kind of, and, and that is more the, the, the type of direct action that um, is possible here now. The ALF type action is much more difficult to do. That the, the, 
the type of more open direct action where there's a, a larger group of people just openly going into places is the type of direct action that is much more possible here now. Yeah, you're making a really good point. And I, I don't, again, most people probably don't know this. My dad was actually a vivisector and it, it was one of my formative experiences as a kid going into his lab. And I didn't see the animals directly, but I knew there were animals on the other side of the wall. And one of the striking things for me as a kid, when I was growing up, he, he worked at a pharmaceutical company called Eli Lilly in central Indiana. And we actually, they actually had pictures of like animal rights activists in a bottle class, right? These classic images of the ALF. <laughs> posted around in their offices and they had massive security. And my dad used to tell me, you know, about these animal rights actors because he knew I was an animal lover as a kid. And he'd say like, don't become one of these dangerous people. And, and all the caricatures and the smears against animal rights actors, that was already happening in the 1990s and the 1980s, right? So the infrastructure of, of kind of corporate propaganda has gotten more sophisticated, but it was already in existence in the 1990s and 19, and in the early 2000s, the 1980s. Um, and the security precautions were starting to be taken. Multiple levels of security, cameras everywhere. And it's why direct action has evolved. And, you know, I, I've always believed in above ground direct action. I've also been supportive of underground action. But the reality is, in today's world where there's a smartphone and a camera everywhere, where the surveillance state and surveillance capitalism is ascendant, you cannot do anything with the expectation that no one's going to catch you. <laughs> Someone's going to find out you're doing what you're doing in today's world. And so we have to do all the work we're doing with the expectation. It's eventually going to come out into the public. And frankly, in the long term, that's a good thing because those of us who believe in truth and justice, we benefit from a world where everything gets sunlight, right? We benefit from that world. So we have to change our tactics to adapt to that. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, one of the things we point out in all of our direct actions is we are not the lawbreakers. The corporations that are abusing animals are lawbreakers. Vivisection facilities in the United States, for example, have a legal obligation to provide humane animal care. This is literally in the text of the animal welfare statute. I'm, I'm looking at it right now, that every single animal must be provided humane care and treatment. And yet the Animal Welfare Act, which is enforced by the Department of Agriculture, considers a cage that is twice the length of a dog. So you've got a beagle who's maybe what, two feet long? If, if the cage is twice the length of the dog, that dog never even has to step outside of a cage for her entire life. She can live her entire life 10 years in a cage that is twice the length of her own body. That is the size of a tomb, my friends. Imagine living in an enclosed space where you had twice the length of your own body. That's it for your entire life of 60 years. And that's considered humane animal care. And that is illegal. That's not just unethical. That is illegal by the text of the very statute that I'm looking at right now. That should be illegal. But we have a government that is so much in collusion with big corporate power and big money that they're not enforcing a law that's literally written on the text of the statutes passed by the people of the United States of America. And I know there are similar provisions in UK law that are not being enforced. So one of the most important mechanisms we've been trying to use at Direct Action Ever is just pointing out that we are resorting to so-called law-breaking activity precisely because the government is not enforcing the laws against the corporate animal abusers that have been breaking the laws of our nation and frankly this globe for the last century or longer. And I think that is one of the big pivots we've seen in direct action activism that has allowed us to earn more public sympathy, hopefully win some court battles. We don't have to spend eight years in prison, although you know maybe some of us will. And maybe most importantly, change these institutions, change these institutions, shake them up and help the public realize these institutions need to change for the future of all life on this earth, frankly, not just the animals, but human beings too. I, th I think the other thing as well is that um, where the ALF was successful was against, say, um, well, over here anyway, against the fur trade, um, against animal experimentation. And, 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 and those, those are huge industries, I mean, particularly the vivisection industry. But compared with the meat industry, be, be, uh, compared with the industries that govern the consumption of animals, um, they're, they're, they're really quite small. I mean, in, in terms of, it, in, in the UK, in the, the differential between the number of animals that are um, killed by the vivisection industry and the number of animals um, that are slaughtered for to be consumed by the population, the, the differential is 2,000. 2,000 more animals are actually um, uh, actually put to death by the by the food industry. So there's a huge difference, and so and I think that kind of determines tactics in a way because um, when you've got something as, as as big as that, I think you have to approach it in a different way, and and I think there has to be um, 
the type of action that will create more public awareness. I mean, with 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 the Animal Liberation Front, it was kind of it was like a direct war, really, between um, the animal liberator, the animal li liberators, uh, and the, the people who oppressed, the, you know, the companies that oppressed animals, and the public weren't involved in it. The public were very much on the sideline. And it was very, very difficult to get any publicity out of the actions that would educate, you know, educate ordinary people. Um, but with the, I think when we're dealing with the um, the meat industry and, and dairy industry, or all the industries to do with um, consuming animal products, um, the public have got a, 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 a big part to, to play in that. And, and, and I think in, in a couple of ways, I mean, first of all, um, by going vegan, you know, the more people that go vegan, the um, uh, the, the, the fewer uh, the, the fewer resources. Um, uh, the, there's less money going into in, into these companies, and and also you're creating more, um, hopefully, more potential activists, and uh, also voters. You know, if, if if people are educated to go vegan, hopefully they'll vote in a more enlightened way. And um, we need more we need more vegan politicians. We need more vegans elected to you know political bodies, whether that's local or national. The more vegans we create, the the, the more chance there is of that. You see, so so it's it, it's really important, I think, when campaigning against these huge industries that the campaigns kind of had an educational aspect, and I think with with open type rescue it, it has that it, ha it it's capable of of this huge educational aspect and i think which is really necessary when it, you know when you're campaigning against that size you know when when the opposition is is so large and so strong yeah i, I think you know obviously this, like this is so powerful to hear you know everything that that you've done and um you know you've challenged these laws for so many years and made so many you know big changes in this world wayne's obviously is, uh you, you know you serve prison time and wayne is obviously currently facing prison time i've also been arrested many times and um, you know, I don't know if, if you guys have thoughts on, you know, how we can maybe even by, you know, using the challenging of laws to, to change them, to actually kind of take it, you know, to the government and get these laws changed for the animals. Yeah, I think maybe I'll start that one because I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I sure, basically, yeah, yeah. Yes. pretty much the reason we started direct action everywhere. I mean, a lot of one of the things that I think most people don't understand about direct action everywhere, including folks who are part of direct action everywhere, is we started this with this specific intention of being a political movement. This is not just going to be a direct action movement, a social justice movement. This is a movement to change our political system. And, you know, we did this because when you look at the history of social justice, until you get to the point where you see these iconic court cases or legislative victories, the public just doesn't get behind you. At the end of the day, I do believe cultural and social normative movements are what create change. And the law of the street is what matters. And the law that's on the books only matters to the extent it affects the streets. And that means what people are eating, what they're buying, what they're doing in their day-to-day -day life, what businesses they support, what businesses they don't support. But it turns out the law on the books heavily affects the law on the street because there's this thing called the expressive function of law. Human beings are incredibly social animals. And unfortunately, as we saw in the last election, they're very status quo oriented. They tend to look to authority to decide what their own preferences and cultural norms should be. And when someone says you're a criminal or some action is a criminal action, that's very bad. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if, no, if someone knows nothing else about your action. Once the law has said your action is unlawful, that is immediately like you know a red mark on the action of the person who's been identified as a criminal. But that works in our favor too. If we can identify certain big corporations as criminal enterprises, then immediately all these people previously had thought these industries are just normal industries. Even if my moral intuitions are, this is absolutely horrible. I can't believe animals are being ripped to pieces alive. I can't believe puppies, puppies are being confined in cages that are twice the length of their own bodies and forced to live in those environments their entire 10 year lives. Most people's moral intuitions are, this is horrible. 
But there are these famous experiments done by Stanley Milgram at Yale that find that even horrors, when there's an authority figure who tells you, no, no, this is just normal, then people go along with it. And, and this is what Hannah Arendt, the famous you know, philosopher called the banality of evil, that evil is usually not the result of the malice of bad people. It's a result of complacency and passivity by good people, that good people think to themselves, well, you know, it seems bad, but the government says it's fine, so it must be fine. So until we shake up the government, get the government on the side of the animals and the people on the planet, we're not going to see much change. And so from day one, DXC was all about not doing direct action for its own sake, not doing direct action just to make a big fuss, although it's sometimes fun to make a big fuss. But because we thought there was a mechanism whereby you could use the disruption and, and, and the power of direct action to transform political systems. So I think if you look at the history of social justice movements in the United States, which is what I'm most familiar with, I cannot think of a single social justice movement that was successful in US history that did not use nonviolent direct action in some way to change laws by breaking them. You know, Susan B. Anthony went to a polling station and said, I'm voting. <laughs> I don't care if you tell me I can't vote. I'm voting anyways. And everyone's like, wait, what are you doing here? You're a woman, you can't vote. She voted anyways, and she got in prison for it. You know, in the early 20th century, uh, women suffrage activists use all forms of direct action in the United Kingdom and the United States to make sure we brought attention to this issue, but then they harness that attention and that energy and that mobilization to create political change. And the civil rights movement, I mean, all of us have heard about this, so I don't even need to talk about King in the 30 or so times he was arrested. But the same is true of the environmental movement. If you look at the early history of the environmental movement, when the environmental movement was powerful, they were using direct actions at places like M M Chica, that that island where the Greenpeace activists basically took it over and said, no, we're not going to allow a nuclear bomb to go off here. We're not going to allow any nuclear test here. That was a huge part of the reason the environmental movement got the momentum it needed to pass the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act and, and really ended nuclear power in the United States. It was pretty astonishing, uh, for better or for worse. You know, people have different views about nuclear power. But it was always part of a strategy of political change. And, and honestly, I think this is one of the areas where we as grassroots actors in the United States and we within direct action are, need to grow. We need to learn how to harness the power of direct action to create political institutional change. And one of the big things we need to do in order to achieve that is just have a strategy, right? You can't just be about, let's go do an open rescue and that's the end of it. It's like, yay, we saved an animal, we got some media, now let's go home and do another one. That doesn't work, folks. That's never gonna achieve change. What we have to do is do open rescues and direct actions that are part of a longer term political strategy that will achieve political power and political change. And there are a billion different ways to do that. And there's no one right answer for what side of strategy you should be using after you do direct action. Sometimes it's media, sometimes it's building relationships, sometimes it's community outreach. But if you don't even think about it, you don't have a plan, you're bound to fail. So we have to start thinking about that in a much more concerted focus and strategic fashion. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, th I think you're right, Wayne. I, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, I look at it in terms of, um, if you're trying to knock down a brick wall, you've got. If you look at the, you know, animal oppression and the forces that support that as a as a brick wall, um, I think that there's kind of two 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 things that you can do, kind of in concert. One is to to bring more force to bear against the wall, and the other thing is to weaken the wall so it's easier to knock down. And I think with um, with with politics, if you if if obviously it's harder to to get a government to change and a government to pass the right sort of laws if they if their fundamental ideology is is opposed to that so as as, as well in ha ha having everyone taking the action that puts pressure on the governments we also need to take action that will change the type of government we've got that will will, will um uh, cause a, a, a better sort of politician to be elected mm. so you've got a government that is kind of more amenable to the changes that we want so I think we have to do both those things I, I, I mean I think this it, it's kind of a, a, a coming together really of different sorts of actions that need to take place because because one sort of action will complement another and I tend to feel that the, the, the different people are cut out to do different things and, and usually that which appeals um most uh to a person um as the sort of action they want to do is probably the sort of action that they'll be best at and they'll be happiest to do and i think that we, we need this kind of broad broad approach to different sorts of um of actions taking place uh, education um direct action um and political action 
all at the same time. And I think I, I think that's the way that that's the way we're going to do it. Yeah, Saul Linsky, the the famous author of Rules for Revolutionaries, one of the favorite lines from that book for me is is a line that you know a great tactic is one that you, your people love. So thinking about you know what what is going to motivate the particular person in front of you is is crucial to determining what role they should have in this ecosystem of activism we're trying to create. Yeah, you know I. My, you know, I kind of sometimes think like, what is our biggest hurdle in this movement? And I, I often feel like it's, it's not necessarily what kind of activism people are doing, but whether or not people are doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, and like, the, you know, the thing that makes me feel the most hopeless is when, you know, I organize a protest and people don't show up and, you know, we just can't get people mobilized and out in the streets. Um, and I'm curious, one, what you guys think is the most, you know, like the biggest hurdle in our movement and two, um, you know, how, how we can overcome it. Yeah, well, maybe I'll start. I, so I, for those of you who don't know the name John Maynard Keynes, John Maynard Keynes is a famous economist who is, has basically been proven right that, and his main theory was this theory called priming the pump, that when you're in a great depression, when economic activity has declined so much that people and businesses don't have the confidence to go out there and work at all, then it's actually a good thing to even ask people to, to shovel holes and then refill them and shovel holes and refill them. That it doesn't actually matter what people are doing. You just need to get people to work, get people to work and, it, and the economy will cover, even if they're filling holes and digging them again, just repeatedly over and over again. And I kind of feel like we're in an activist depression right now, worldwide, relative to where we need to be, the amount of activism we need in our society for the climate, for economic justice, in, in the Bay Area, certainly for housing and homelessness and for animal rights, we're facing an activist depression. And when you're in a depression, you just need to get people to work in whatever, whatever capacity they want to do it even if it's digging holes and refilling them, just get them to work. Because, and the reason that matters, both from an economic perspective and from an activist perspective, is because again, of that expressive function. When you see people getting to work and in the economy, it gives other people confidence that I can go out and buy things. There are people getting salaries. There are people who are engaged in economic activity that gives businesses confidence to reopen their doors or to invest a little more. And similarly with activism, you know, huge part of what you're doing as an activist is just normalizing activism. <laughs> and showing the people around you, there are people in this world who care about the future of our planet, who care about the animals on this earth. And by going out there and doing whatever you're doing, whether it's lobbying, protesting, open rescues, or, or, or vegan outreach, it is sending that message to the world around you. Um, with respect to your question, I mean, this is the million dollar question that activists have been asking, organizers have been asking, frankly, probably for 2.5 million years, probably from the first you know, homo habilis primate who said, hey, I want to try and convince all our people to move to the other side of the mountain. How do I convince everyone to work together to do it? I mean, it's, it's hard. And, you know, there's this fundamental problem that a Nobel Prize winning economist identified called the collective action problem, which is to say, whenever there's some collective project, some public project that we all sort of benefit from, but each individual's contribution to it seems very small, we all have a tendency to say, well, I'm such a small piece of the puzzle you know, our society is gonna move in that direction or not, and whether I participate or not doesn't matter. And that attitude makes everyone just sit at home, even when we all realize we have to change, right? It's, you know, climate change is a great example. This is where we all realize, hey, we don't do something about this. In Northern California, we've gotten wildfires at historic levels, wildfires the likes of which never seen before in history. And yet, even in the most recent election, all the progressive environmental candidates, including me, sadly. So Ronnie, I have to disappoint you and say, <laughs> I ran for office and I lost miserably. So it was my first try. So hopefully next time I do better if I run for office again. But even in progressive California, the environmentally progressive candidates all lost. And all the people thought to themselves, well, you know, I'd like someone to do this, but do we really have to do this in California? I mean, should we pay higher taxes? Should we give up our natural gas stoves and our cars and our meat? To save the planet. And th they decided, no, let, let's let the people in Illinois or China or India or someone else do this. And, and so this is, this is a political example of a phenomenon that accused, occurs in human psychology all over the world and has occurred since the beginning of the human species, the collective action problem. But the way you solve the collective action problem is, is sort of twofold. One is you've got organizers that come forward and, and instill in people the sense that they do have power, right? You might feel very small in the face of this problem, but frankly, it is not until you realize that you are part of the solution, that your individual contribution is crucial to saving the planet, stopping the abuse of animals, stopping economic injustice. 
And you need leaders and organizers. And, and collectively, we need to instill in ourselves this sense of power in the face of the insecurity, the fear, the anxiety that large institutions are trying to instill in us. We have to combat that fear and anxiety and uncertainty with confidence and power. But the second thing we have to do is we have to be transparent and accountable to each other. I mean, there, there is a, a, an accountability side to this. And in, in societies that function, you know, they create legal systems and they say, hey, we've all made this mutual commitment to, for example, making sure no one poisons the well, no one's gonna poop in the well. And if someone does poop in the well, you say, hey, why'd you poop in the well? That's gross. You know, that you kind of contaminated the water for all of us. And similarly with activist movements, I think part of what we need to do is create not, not punitive, but accountability mechanisms that make people realize that yes, I do have the power to, to take charge of this crisis the planet is facing, but no, when I don't do that, there's a consequence for all of us, you know? And all of us have been involved in teams where there's no accountability at all and no one even notices when someone doesn't step up. And those teams always fall apart, they're failures. But when we create positive and encouraging empowering mechanisms to hold each other accountable and realize that we can't count on politicians and celebrities to solve these problems. It is the ordinary people of this earth. When they start taking responsibility for themselves over the future that we can build, that is when social change is going to happen. And that's when we'll see a mass movement. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's something that seems to have become, uh, certainly over here, an, an increasing problem um, with the pandemic. I mean, we've noticed in the, the types of action that we organise, although it's been limited locally, that fewer people have wanted to become involved. And, and now whether that's to do with those people have additional problems because of the pandemic or, or, or whatever, I don't know. But when you think that um, there's an increasing number of, of, of vegans or people who claim to be vegan, um, then you would think that that would lead to an increasing number of activists, but that hasn't really happened. And uh, I, I think the sociological reasons for that, I think because um, way, way back in the, the 1980s, when the animal uh, rights movement, as you said earlier, when, when that kind of all started to grow up, um, if somebody was a vegan, it was, it was a kind of like 95% chance, perhaps more, they'd also be an activist. And people would often become activists before they became vegan because in those days, it was a lot easier actually to be an activist than to live as a vegan. It was much easier to be a hunt saboteur or a, um, uh, you know, a campaigner against um, vivisection. Much easier to do that than to live as a vegan because that was so difficult. <laughs> and so people, what, what happened was people become activists and then they become vegans. It would be that way around. Whereas now it's comparatively so easy, um, I think, to become a vegan that what, what people are doing is they're just changing a few things in their life. They're just they're just switching the like the meat burger for the, the you know for, for the vegan burger, uh, and they're just they're just changing a few things and then and they and then feeling good about that. Oh, I no longer have to worry about that. I no longer have to worry that I'm buying into um, the slaughter of animals, and then they just carry on the same as they were before. I think, and I think this is the difference. It's not so because so much easier now that people don't. Um, the people that are becoming vegan aren't, aren't, aren't they kind of not in a sense made of the same stuff that, you know, when the, the, the people that became vegan way back in the say 1970s, 80s, um, it, because it was so difficult, those people it, it, it were, were prepared to, to take on a, a more difficult thing. Uh, like becoming activists as well. And I think this is kind of why that's a kind of a quick, sort of sociological reason i think why why there is this the percentage of vegans or activists is so is so small now and it's like a question of like how do we how do we get more of those people to become active and it's kind of it is difficult because it because often like it seems everything you try doesn't <laughs> doesn't seem to work and i kind of think i mean it is, is it is a difficult time at the moment with um, over here with people not being able to get on the streets and that right at the moment but I think one, one thing that can be done is to suggest to people that, you know, that they can be activists in a small way. Um, I mean, somebody can be an activist just by kind of leaving flyers in a public place or just, you know, delivering flyers to, you know, to people's houses or um, uh, 
kind of just 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 helping in a small way, an information stall, um, uh, and you know, or just kind of being you know acting in 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 some way as a support to to to, to people that are kind of doing um, are doing the main action, something like that. That it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that those people have to kind of um, do anything that would cause any major stress to themselves, I suppose, in a way. And just suggesting to people you don't have to be, uh, it's kind of not an all or nothing thing in terms of like, you've, you, you've either got to be the, the big activist or, 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 or not do any activism at all. There's, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole array of different sorts of activism that people can do. And then perhaps if once someone kind of puts their toe in the water and becomes an activist in a small way, there's a chance that they'll then kind of increase the level of their activism once they're kind of getting used to the fact that they have become an activist maybe that's a maybe that's a way that it could work but it is it is it's a very very difficult it's something that's kind of kind of troubled me for years uh trying to uh try to get people to be active i think the other thing is that um a lot of stuff can be done just with a small number of people you know you can get a relatively small number of people who who are committed that can kind of achieve a lot. So although it's preferable to have large numbers, I don't think you necessarily always have to in order to achieve things. Yeah, I, I just want to amplify one thing you said, which is about lowering the barriers to entry and kind of making sure. I, I, I just talked about how we have to inspire people to see their own power and then and hold each other accountable to our commitments. While we do have to hold each other accountable, I think that the key thing is we should hold each other accountable to the commitments people have actually made. And if someone is committed to contributing a dollar a year to an environmental campaign, great. That's amazing. We should be acknowledging and support of that. If they want to go out there and, and poster one day out of the week, that's great too. Acknowledge and, and, and support that and encourage that because every movement, I mean, I feel like I've said this a number of times recently, but the sociologist Duncan Watts talks about social movements being like the, the layers of an onion. And there are many different layers and the more our layers tend to be bigger. They're away from the core. They're not as kind of dedicated as this core group of activists, but they provide immense protection for the inner, inner, inner portions of the movement. And, and every layer depends on the other layers. And each layer, as you go further away from the core is actually bigger than the last one. So the number of people who are, you know, adopting vegan diets or trying to avoid products tested on animals or trying to avoid their cars that's going to be much larger than the number of people who are going out there and handing out leaflets. And that's going to be larger than the number of people who are going out there and doing political lobbying. And that's going to be smaller than the number of people like Wani who spent prison time sacrificing their freedom for, for movements. But each stage of the movement, each layer is absolutely crucial. We have to find ways to support all of them. And I think the key thing that keeps all these layers tied together and motivates people on all these layers is frankly social connection. I mean, there's the study we talk about in our workshop at at DAC, How to Change the World in One Generation by Doug McAdam, a Stanford sociologist who we're still in touch with pretty regularly. I'm probably going to hang out with him sometime in the next couple of months. And he did the famous study of the Freedom Rhymes showing that the number one factor by a huge margin, the absolute number one factor in determining whether someone joined the Freedom Rhymes or not is if they had a friend who was a Freedom Rider. If they had one friend who was a Freedom Rider, increased their odds of becoming a Freedom Rider by 80%. And if they had one friend who dropped out of the Freedom Rides, it actually decreased their chances of becoming a Freedom Rider, but I think it was like 60%. So one friend joining or dropping out was virtually determinative of whether someone would become a Freedom Rider themselves. And all the other factors, education, commitment, uh, demographics, wealth, gender, all those factors made no difference at all compared to that one huge factor, which is whether you had a connection in the Freedom Rides. And we saw this with the Birmingham campaign too. And, and, in 1955, I think it was, when they started the Birmingham campaign, the absolute crucial reason that came to this campaign succeeded, and the reason they got, I believe it was over 90% of the black population in Birmingham, or Montgomery, I'm sorry, not Birmingham, Montgomery, I'm confusing cities. The reason King got 90% of people to join that bus boycott uh, after Rosa Parks was arrested was because of the social connections in the church. People felt connected to the other black members of their community. They felt like they had solidarity with each other because they were part of the same community. And so 90% of them stuck to the boycott, even when some of them had to walk like hours. You know, some of these folks had to walk hours to get to work in the morning. Imagine sacrificing two hours every single day of your life to movement, right? It's, and, and walking this laborious, you know, multi-mile track to your job. 
and then coming home in that same two hour trek, right? But they got 90% of people to do this because of social connection. And one of the great flaws of the left, especially right now in American politics and around the world is the left is a very isolated movement. We are all in our own little kind of echo chambers. We're all in our own little apartments, cl cl closed up in these, you know, huge urban landscapes. We all live in our apartments. We have no idea who our neighbors are. We have no community connections because we give up the church. We don't like things like Rotary Clubs and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And so one of the things DXC has done that I think other groups should model, and, and frankly, environmental activists are starting to do this too, because I talked to Jim Christopher at the Climate Disobedience Center, and they're trying to do the same thing, is we need to create civic organizations that serve social functions as well, because as long as people do not feel connected to their comrades, they're not going to fight together. Yeah, that's that's all super interesting and really important. And, you know, I it really hit me what you said, Ronnie, about, you know, that, you know, back when ALF was was really active, more people were activists for animals than people were vegan. Um, and that you've kind of seen like uh, veganism maybe make people uh, feel like that's their justification for not being active. I, I just found that really fascinating and, um, you know, I kind of want to go back to something that you said though earlier on um, on the call, which was that you were afraid when you went to prison the first time that it would decrease the number of, of people who would be mobilized to take action for animals. And you said that it had the opposite effect. And I'm I'm curious, kind of one, how how the uh, the ALF kind of uh, framed the narrative around you going to prison, um, and you know, kind of exactly how it went down in a way where, where you feel like it was effective in mobilizing even more people to take action. Well, I think in a way, the, um, um, the, the, the kind of national media uh, played a part in it because, of course, their main, you know, their main aim is to, is to sell newspapers. So they, they'll print stories that they think will be most likely to sell newspaper. And when we were sent to prison, myself and, and, and the other guy that were, we, we, the, we got three years um and this was way back in uh that had been way, way back in 1975 where we were sentenced um the i, I think that the, the 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 biggest selling newspapers or the second largest selling newspaper in the country had a, had a front page that their whole front page was was dedicated to us and the headline was non was non-meat martyrs and and the, the article is about there's these two guys that were that were basically martyrs that had tried to destroy this horrific um, laboratory that was going to carry out this laboratory was going to carry out radiation experiments on animals, and it kind of um, the, the 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 article was written from the point of view that we were heroes and that we shouldn't have been sent to prison and and that these animal experiments were appalling, and obviously the newspaper thought that that was the type of story that would sell the most. <laughs> sell the most copies and I think that had a big effect and I think for the first time I think a lot of people didn't know didn't know about the ALF you know a lot of um, uh, young people that were kind of concerned about animals what was happening to them didn't know about the ALF and this and, and this enabled them to kind of discover um, uh, what was going on I think the other, the, the other thing that led to the um, uh, the increase in ALF activism is that is that the hunt saboteurs um, started getting um, uh, more publicity on 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 national media, and um, people joined hunt saboteurs. And then once they joined the hunt saboteurs and got into direct action, then uh, you know they became aware of the ALF, and uh, a, a, a lot of those people then went on to become ALF activists. So um, it was kind of more, although for some people the fact that we'd gone to prison, I think, would have acted as a de deterrent. The, the, the publicity that surrounded it actually made people aware of uh, of what was going on and and so that that attracted more people but it was a very pleasant surprise I had you know when I came out of prison I had all these like mostly young people coming up to me and saying how, how do I get involved I want to do I want to do the same thing and it was absolutely <laughs> it was brilliant you know absolutely brilliant and then that was really when the ALF took off and and we were able to carry out um stuff that on, on a larger scale, more, more complicated types of action because we had more people. Yeah, and if I could say just two things about why that occurred with the ALF, because um, the, the experience of the Shack campaign was very different, right? The, the media around the Shack campaign was awful. 
And it, it absolutely did gut the animal rights movement in the mid 2000s. And, and you know, I, I saw this myself. Many of my friends went to prison in the Shack campaign. Uh, but there are two things that I think were crucial about those early ALF actions. One is, if you know anything about what hunt saboteurs are doing in these anti-vivisection campaigns, it was very clearly the case that these were the little guys, good and ordinary people going up against luxury and power and wealth, right? When you look at kind of these, these dumb hunts that rich people in the UK do, it's these people in these fancy suits who ride around on horses with dogs and literally rip foxes to shreds just for fun. You know, they're watching, they're training their dogs to rip these poor foxes to pieces. And foxes are very sympathetic animals. They look like dogs. And it's, it's not many ordinary people who are involved in this practice. It's just the rich who are doing this. And it's just like anyone sees them just says, frankly, even just on, you know, just kind of wealth and equality grounds. Really, you have the time to spend running around on your horse in this fancy outfit, just ripping foxes to shreds. It's not something that's particularly sympathetic to the average person. And similarly with these vivisection campaigns, you know, going after these big secretive laboratories that are the height of wealth and corruption and corporate influence and politics was very strategic and a part of the reason why they got the narrative they got. The Shaq campaign in the United States, which also was targeting a big, powerful vivisection company, I think went wrong when it started targeting individual people. And I don't think this is an ethical mistake because I think a lot of these individual people were responsible for horrendous acts of abuse. But when my friend Josh Schwartz, for example, went to prison, he went to prison because he threw a brick through a window at a financial store where ordinary people were working, you know, a financial institution who had very little connection to the animal abuse. Um, when Lauren Gazzola and Kevin Jonas went to prison, part of what compelled that jury to convict them and compelled the media to write these negative articles was the fact that there were many activists, not them, unfortunately, but other activists who had targeted people's homes, including doing things like digging through someone's garbage and finding, I mean, this is a horrible example, but they literally dug through someone's garbage, found kind of panties that had blood on them and then put them on the internet and saying, you know, we know where your panties are. And when, when, that, when that focus shifted away from systems and these big, powerful, oppressive systems and the wealthy, powerful people at the top of these systems, to an ordinary like mid-level executive or even a high-level executive at a financial firm that was a step away from the animal abuse, people lost sight of the moral cause of the, of the movement and started thinking we we're just bullies and terrorists, right? Even though they weren't. And even though the folks who are leading this campaign in the United States weren't actually doing these things themselves, all they did was kind of post it. They would post what was happening and they had a perspective that, you know, no holds barred. When it comes to animal abuse, we're gonna just support and publish everything. And I think that was a mistake. I think we have to maintain that systemic focus in our activism and help ordinary people realize that we're on their side and not against them. And second, we absolutely, 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 and I'd actually be interested in Ronnie's perspective on this, but my view is we absolutely have to maintain nonviolence. That nonviolence is not just a philosophical ideal. It is that too. You know, I, I'm a Buddhist. Many of you know that I believe deeply in nonviolence, but it's a strategic imperative too. It's not just about some you know, idealistic commitment to being kind and compassionate. It is actually crucial to our success. And Oliver agrees. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think I, I, I think if we want the, to, to, to take the public with us, which we have to do, then then nonviolence is really important as a tactic. I think I think that's you know that's absolutely vital. Um, I think there was um, um, <laughs> another reason, um, though, over here why because that didn't stay the same with the ALF in terms of um, in terms of the media in, in in the early days in the early days of, of, of the ALF um, there was a lot of sympathy from from the mainstream um, media but that changed um, and I think what it was was at the beginning um, the they saw us just as a, a small a, a small group of people that were taking action against, um, you know, to prevent cruelty to animals, and they kind of thought, well, you know, to be to for the for the newspapers to say to be on our side was what would be most popular with with ordinary people. So that's why they, you know, a lot of the stories were sympathetic to us. But then, as the as the ALF grew, they began to realise that that it was actually. A, uh, becoming a threat to big corporations and very powerful corporations and of course you know the the, the media the newspaper industry newspaper um, bosses are very much part of that whole scene and so because of that because they, they 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 saw that we were had become a kind of threat to corporate business and they were part of corporate business I think that's when they changed 
um, when they realised that th this wasn't just a, a few people doing, you know, occasional actions and that in the end those people would go away, which I th think is what what they thought at the beginning and i think that's that's why the, that's why the kind of attitude towards the um what why the attitude of the media to, towards the alf um changed because it's very interesting that in the um the first time i was sent to prison i was a, a martyr and the third time i was sent to prison i was a terrorist according to the the national newspapers and and that's because in the, in those intervening years in in those 10 years between around about 10, 10, 12 years between those two court cases, the ALF had, had, had become so much larger and, and so much more of a threat. And so the, so the reporting of ALF actions, you know, changed accordingly. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I think actually, I just want to say one thing, just yeah, real yeah. quick, Zoe, on that. We are going through exactly that same process in the United States right now with respect to open rescue. Where in the earliest stages there was almost no legal repression, you know the media was almost universally positive, and and now, even in my most recent campaign, the fact that I've rescued animals, I've literally taken sick and dying animals out of factory farms, was used to attack me politically, by media outlets, by political figures who are connected with huge amounts of money, companies like Amazon that are making literally billions of dollars and selling us dumb stuff like humane meat, right at Whole Foods. And, and so what, and this is precisely why we cannot just do direct action and then go home. Because if you do direct action and go home and don't do the hard communications and political work and, and community organizing, that's gonna allow us to maintain the right narrative about these direct actions. What happened to the ALF in the United Kingdom in the 1970s and the United States in the 1980s and 90s will happen to the open rescue movement. They will seize the narrative. They will convince the public, which is usually not well versed in these issues. They're just looking at a very superficial level at these issues. And frankly, this is kind of what happened in the, our political campaign, the mayor's race in Berkeley, where people looked at a very superficial level. They saw the propaganda that was being used. This is a dangerous person. This is somebody who has 16, they actually said 17 felonies, but I only have 16 felonies for the record. It's not 17, it's 16. But they said, this is somebody who has 17 felonies against him. And he is a, literally the term they used was a real threat, a real threat, right? And the idea that taking a sick animal to the vet is threatening is the narrative we have to challenge because we know that's ridiculous, that's absurd. And most ordinary people would support us, but that's why we have to go out there bravely and not just do the direct actions, but explain them, do communications around them, talk to politicians and prosecutors about them, explain to them how we are the ones on the right side of not just the ethical issue, but the legal issue. Um, because otherwise, if we don't, what happened to the ALF in the 1970s in the UK and what happened to the ALF in the 1980s and 90s with forget what it was called, it was called like Operation Bite Back or Backfire, Operation Backfire. Um, that is what's gonna to happen to the open rescue movement too, if we don't, if we don't seize the narrative. Yeah, I think that's very important. And I think also in, in, in a sense, uh, there are more outlets to do that now because, you know, because way, way, way back then in, you know, um, up until fairly recently, um, the only means of, um, someone in the street really receiving information would have been from uh, the newspapers or from the television. But now with social media, we've got an another way of actually, uh, you know, putting our case across to the public. So that's kind of, that that has, although of course, you know, the, <laughs> the people on the other side can use social media as well. It does mean that we, that, that it gives us um, another means of um, getting our, um, our point of view across to people so we you know that that's an area where it kind of I, I think has Im improved for us to some extent um but yes that's right because they they will as, as soon as um anything is perceived as a threat to to big corporations they'll use I mean the thing is that the, one thing I will say is is um they've got the money um but we've we've got the people and so it's a question of um, us being able to use our numbers in the right way, you know, to, to kind of combat their money. Uh, and that means that, you know, getting a lot of people out there putting our message across. Yeah, and uh, I, I was just gonna ask before, um, 
when, you know, Wayne, you kind of mentioned nonviolence and, um, you know, obviously I think a, a really controversial question that someone, that someone commented is, is pro uh, Curtis commented is property destruction violence. And I know a lot of people have uh, mixed views on this, I, um, but I, I just want to open up that conversation and, and hear um, both of your perspectives. You well, I'd say, I, I, yeah. Well, I think it. I, I, I think it depends on what someone. I, I mean, as far as we were concerned with the ALF, that um, you know, our policy was not to harm, um, was not to harm life, whether it's human life or or non-human life. That you know, to take the utmost care not to do that. And obviously, a, a, you know, a lot of our campaign was aimed at causing damage to property. But you see, it was kind of we were fighting a different sort of battle you know like, like i said earlier our, our battle was you know directly against the animal oppressors it, it didn't involve the public we, we were wanting to cause the maximum damage to them so that they would stop doing what they were doing and and and, and that was um that was kind of very successful and it kind of um particularly against the uh, particular fur industry because we were causing them so much economic loss um just because they sold a one particular product when a lot of these stores you know sold a, a multitude of things and it just wasn't worth them carrying on selling furs and you know because of the damage because of the damage we were causing and so it was successful in 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 that respect and i think where where the kind of success came um in reducing the number of animal experiments a lot of it was to do with the media. A lot of it was to do with this, um, how the media were portraying us as terrorists, because um, that created a climate of fear amongst um, animal experimenters and amongst um, you know, companies that financed um, animal experiments. And I think put pressure on them to, to look at other ways of, of doing it, to look at non-animal methods. And um, but that was um, largely to do with the with the media uh making out that the alf was a lot more dangerous than we really are and making out that we were a lot more violent than we really are and it kind of worked uh, it, it so it kind of worked perhaps in the opposite way um to what they intended in that respect so but that was that was to do with a particular campaign like i said where you, where you're not kind of involving the public but where you want to where you want to bring the public on side i think that um causing damage to property or, or causing serious damage to property can have a negative effect and i think that you know campaigns now of 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 the involved direct action are very much more about bringing the public on side than what the alf was and so um the idea of causing damage to property, I think, would need to be viewed differently now in the context of those campaigns. Yeah, that's a very, very thoughtful and nuanced answer. My my answer is surprisingly going to be more, more strong, and I, I think it's not. It, it, it property destruction is not violence, but but that is the ethical question of whether it's violence or not. There's still a strategic question of whether it's going to be perceived as nonviolent, and we're working in an ecosystem where even taking an animal out of a factory farm to the vet is considered terrorism and dangerous and extremism. And one of the things Erica Chenoweth points out in her work on, on social movements and her work, everyone should be aware of her work, go and read her book or some of her articles if you haven't, Erica Chenoweth who wrote the book, Why Civil Resistance Works, is what matters sadly is not whether something is actually nonviolent or whether it's perceived as nonviolent, right? And she gives example in her book of or maybe it's not in a book, maybe it's one of her essays, but I know she's given this example many times, burning the American flag. You know, we have a First Amendment right to burn the American flag. It's a constitutional right. It doesn't hurt anyone. It's, it's a piece of cloth that you're burning, but it turns out a lot of Americans feel genuinely threatened. They think that what you're gonna do next is punch me in the face, or you're gonna start a revolution and start <laughs> shooting people. And so, you know, the implication that people jump to irrationally, in my view, I, I personally feel burning the American flag should be totally protected and it's, it, it should be a legitimate form of protest. But because people immediately leap from that conclusion, especially in the media ecosystem where you have Fox News and all these conservative outlets trying to demonize and terrify people about what burning the American flag means, that next thing you're gonna do is burn down someone's home. Next thing you're gonna do is, I mean, so like in the wildfires in Northern California, Fox News was saying over and over again that Antifa was burning 
down our communities, like Antifa. Like, why would Antifa burn down our communities? Why would they start wildfires? It makes no sense. And it's not true. But that's where they were going. And a lot of people believe this. Even Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's not like a right wing. I mean, he's, he's more nuanced than that. But many of you know that he went on his podcast, which has, I don't know how many viewers, like 20 million people, 5 million on YouTube alone, plus another 30 or 40 million people listening to his podcast. He bought that lot. He said, yeah, I've heard that Antifa folks are starting fires. And so you might not realize that you're burning an American flag that seems like a very peaceful act of protest is leading to people like Joe Rogan to say to their 50 million followers that activists are burning down people's homes. But that's the logical conclusion some people irrational reach. So being very sophisticated and strategic about our communications and understanding how we live in a media climate where every one of our actions is gonna be construed in the worst way possible by our adversaries in the corporate world is absolutely crucial. And so, I mean, this is why the civil rights activists did things that might seem a little silly to us, like wear their Sunday best. It's like when you're wearing a suit, it's very hard to demonize someone as a criminal. This is why at DXC, we do things like hold flowers around. And even though we're holding flowers around, you know, like at our penalty of poultry action in the end of 2018, you literally had a bunch of like people, including children and grandparents, just holding flowers, walking around, giving veterinary care to animals. And still the Sonoma County authorities said that we assaulted people or engaged in violent acts, right? You cannot get more nonviolent than that, yet they still decried us as being violent. So it is very important when we think about nonviolence to think about not just the actual facts of the act and what philosophically and ethically it stands for, but also how it's going to be construed and manipulated by the media into something that's not. And for that reason, you know, as a general matter, ethically, I have no problem with property destruction, especially if you're talking about a fossil fuel company or a factory farm. And the ELF and the ALF for decades now have had the credo, we harm no one. We absolutely will harm no living creature, human or non-human, in our actions. But it doesn't matter because those actions will be construed in a way by our adversaries that will make people feel like they're being physically threatened. And so we have to be mindful of that in our actions and be very, very careful when we engage in acts of property destruction, if at all. Yeah, that, those are both, uh, both of you raised some really brilliant points there. And uh, we only have about five minutes left. So just, um, you know, before we wrap things up, I wanna make sure we get um, Alexandra Paul, who's an absolute legend um, and an amazing actress and animal rights actress who I'm honored to have, have, have worked with before. And, um, you know, she's been arrested for animals, just awesome person. She asked a question, um, how do we leverage COVID to get rid of factory farming? So if um, maybe the two of you just wanna quickly answer that question. Should I? Uh, yeah, I mean, what we what we've been doing, um, uh, what we've been doing um, locally, because um, it, we're very restricted on on kind of actions we can take um, because of COVID. Is um, before the most recent lockdown, which has prevented us from doing even that, we were delivering flyers to people's homes, pointing out that connection. We delivered, I think, thousands of those around. And we've also run social media campaigns uh, using video uh, to point out that connection. Uh, in other areas, people have done uh, uh, street stores with, with posters and um, in, in a kind of socially distanced way uh, to educate the public about that. And, and I think it's just a question at the moment of like, kind of just spreading that message, spreading that information um, as, as much as we can to educate people about that about that connection um, between between COVID and, uh, and and animal oppression. So I'll say two things. Um, one is, right now, if you're not already doing it, you should be trying to form connections with folks outside of the animal rights world that are working on COVID mitigation and protection and prevention, I should say. And you look at someone like Jonathan Epstein, who's a very famous veterinary epidemiologist, who's the one who identified the SARS virus as coming from bats. He has this methodology called One Health that I think veterinary professions, professionals and epidemiologists all over the world are now really focused on. And the idea behind One Health, if you haven't heard about it, is healthy people, healthy animals, healthy planet. We need these three things to stop epidemic diseases. And we certainly don't have healthy animals. We definitely don't have a healthy planet. And frankly, we don't even have healthy people because so few people in this country have basic access to medical care, right? So this is an opportunity for us to point out that healthy animals and certainly factory farms do not have healthy animals, which is why 80% of the antibiotics in the station are being fed to farm animals, not to human beings. We need to hammer that point down and say, hey, this is not us saying this. 
This is the folks who are trying to stop the next pandemic and save your grandmother from dying from the current pandemic saying, we need to have healthy animals. And there's no way, there's no way for us to have healthy animals and feed 7 billion people on the diet we're currently feeding them. So let's form relations with them. And I think those relationships, I think there's value in both weak ties and strong ties. I think what DXC has been doing with the No More Factory Farms, uh, No Factory Farms campaign is great where we have all these coalitional partners and they're not necessarily in super invest in the campaign. We just throw their logo on a page or we throw our logo on their page and there's just a relationship that's formed. But strong ties are really important too. We should spend like the 5% of effort we need to get weak ties and groups that are willing to just like throw their logo onto our page and then spend 85, 95% effort in defining these stronger institutional ties with folks who are actually going to actively collaborate with us on campaigns. So there's, don't spend too much time in the middle, spend a little bit amount of time to get someone's logo on. And then when you find someone's really interested and you could form a relationship, then spend the extra time on the folks who are really interested. So that's one thing we need to do. Form institutional relationships with folks outside of the animal rights movement who are doing COVID work. Second thing we need to do is I think, especially after this election, this election has, in the United States at least, has sucked all the oxygen out of the media ecosystem. If you're not talking about Trump and Biden, it's very hard to get anything published. No one cares about anything other than Trump or Biden, which is really unfortunate because if you care about national elections, you're basically caring about political theater. No, it doesn't really matter in my view, you know, and that's controversial. I'm sorry for all the folks who are gonna be really upset at this comment. But my view is national politics is mostly theater. There's some big differences between Trump and Biden, but the reality is most of the transformative changes we hope to create are going, and frankly, we need to create are gonna happen at the local level. So. Again, apologies to any of you who invested a huge amount in the national election. So we can argue about that on a future occasion. But regardless of what you feel about that, the result of this election is now over. Now there's gonna be more oxygen for other stories. And one of the stories that absolutely is gonna be told, especially as we get a vaccine and people move on from COVID is, is basically the breakdowns of what happened and why it happened. There are gonna be longer thoughtful pieces written by bloggers, by journalists, by documentary makers about how COVID happened and what lessons our society has to learn. It is absolutely crucial that we get out there in the media, in blogs, on social media, and video production, and tell the story of the animals and how fundamentally the story of COVID and the story of every pandemic, and frankly, human history, has been a story of a distorted relationship with nature and the other life on this earth. You know, go to the CDC's website right now. You can Google this. Look up CDC history of pandemics. Go and, go and look at it right now. And what you'll find is a website on the CDC's own page that sets out all the major pandemics in the United States over the last hundred years. Every single one of them came from a factory farm. Not from a bat, not from, not from a pangolin. Every single one prior to COVID-19 came from a factory farm. And frankly, to this day, it might still be the case that COVID came from a domesticated farm animal. We know that there's some genetic information in pangolins and bats that seems related to COVID-19, but the, the science on pandemic spread suggests that pigs in particular are mixing vessels. They're the intermediate hosts that is the most common host that jumps from a wild animal species to domesticated spe animal species to human beings. So it's it's very likely, in my view, you know, I maybe not very likely, but it's it's very possible that when when we actually do the final breakdown of COVID, that the immediate vector of this disease that jumped from animals to human beings was not a bat or a pangolin, as bad as that is. And we should not be killing and eating bats. We should not be hunting down endangered species and killing and eating them. And we can condemn and blame the Chinese all we want. But the reality is most pandemics in the US history have not come from bats and penguins in China. They've come from pigs and chickens here in the United States, including probably the great flu pandemic of 1918, which is still the greatest killer in probably human history when it comes to pandemics. So we need to make sure that story is told. There are media outlets that are already interested in this. Vox did a great video on this. New York Times has done some great work, but it, it all bubbles up from the ground up. So we need to start telling the story. We need to start blogging about it, YouTubing about it, doing Facebook live streams about this as our society starts engaging in a more reflective time period where we ask ourselves, how did this happen? And what can we do to stop this next time? Thanks so much for those awesome answers. And uh, I know that Aloha is coming to an end. So before we uh, hand it back to Joanna, I don't know if either of you have any final words that you'd like to, to share with everybody or with each other. Well, I'd just like to say that uh, I mean this 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 kind of three things that I <laughs> that I say to people, um, uh, and what is I'd say to people um, if if you're not a vegan, become a vegan. If you're a vegan but not an activist, become an activist. And if you're an activist but not an organizer, uh, become an organizer. 
because um, actions don't happen unless someone organises it. And so it, it's really important that people kind of step up to the plate and become organisers or become involved in organising with other people. Because the more organisers we have, you know, the more actions we're going to have and the more actions we, we have, the more likely we are to change things. So that's that's kind of what my message um, would would be to, 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 to anyone listening to this, whether they're listening now or whether they're going to listen to the recording. I can't put it better than that. I think that's a great way to conclude. I'll just say, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, you know, I, I just started a podcast a couple months, months ago called the Green Pill Podcast. So this is an amazing conversation. I'm so glad I was able to chat with you, Ronnie, and I want to hang out with you at some point in the future, for sure. Uh, that would be great, but, Wayne. <laughs> uh, we're, we're trying to have conversations like this on my podcast, and I'd love for you all to join it. So go to green, thegreenpillpodcast.com and check us out, because this is how we all learn. This is how we share. This is how I process things. I learned things today from Ronnie. But I actually completely forgotten about the, the media that the ALF got initially and how it was twisted by the government and by corporations into a negative thing. And, and that's an important lesson. We have to remember these lessons because if we don't remember the lessons of history, we're doomed to fail again. All right. Thank you both so much. And thanks to Zoe for helping us, you know, direct the conversation a little bit there. And yeah, thank you so much to Wayne and Ronnie um, for being here and sharing your experiences. It was so great hearing just your stories and, um, you know, learning all that I can from, from what you've uh, shared today. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, sometimes at the end of these calls, we like to kind of finish with a little call to action for everybody who's on the call. So today's call to action uh, kind of comes from Ronnie. Um, let's just pull this up here. Uh, so today we are asking everyone to just take action for animals. So whether you want to chalk in an area where there's a lot of pedestrians or put up posters, leaflet, uh, maybe you want to get involved with a local animal rights group, um, you know, depending on what's happening with COVID. Uh, we just can't let the current situation um, allow us to become complacent. And we need to remember that action is ultimately what is going to create this change and activism is essential. So however you can manage to do that during this time is really important. And yeah, just a reminder for all of us to kind of recommit ourselves to taking action. So we've come to the end of our assembly for today. And I just want to thank you all so much for being a part of it. I also just wanted to take a moment to express gratitude again for everyone who helped out today, Zoe, uh, Wayne and Ronnie, of course, Sally, our musician, and Amanda, our, our ASL interpreter, and everyone else who works behind the scenes to make these calls possible. Um, we have a little borrowed tradition that we like to do at the end of these calls, and this is called the Unity Clap. Um, it started with the United Farm Workers Movement in the 60s, and it was kind of a way for uh, the workers to show the solidarity amongst language divides. So they couldn't speak the same language, but they could do this clap together. And at the end of each day, they would do this clap, which kind of symbolized that their alliance and their common struggles. And it reminded them that as allies, they rise and fall together. And so despite all the barriers that are between us today, just remember that we are united and you are part of this global movement and we are rising together. So the clap starts off slow and it gets faster and faster and we end with one final clap. And we're going to allow people to unmute themselves now so that we can hear all the beautiful chaos of this final thing. And then uh, the call will be over. So um, you should be able to unmute yourself now and you can go ahead and do that. And we'll start the clap and we'll see you all next month. I was in this photo somewhere. <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Hey, 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 thanks for joining. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs>